but it's still a really good snapshot of of an animal husbandry system, right? You tame them, you can euthanize the ones that like you know maybe don't have the qualities and traits you want. Um, what? <laughs> what? Wow, I did not think we were going to go to euthanization here on this. You can put them down. What are you going to do in ashes when you tame a bunch of creatures? You're going to have to put them somewhere, right? Eventually, you're going to have to like delete the thing, right? When it's reached its usefulness. Oh, God. <laughs> Such an epic adventure to traverse the Varan landscape. Looking back on their arrival, the Pathfinder and his companions couldn't help but appreciate that they had one another for this journey they had begun. They were in good company, and this was an unspoken truth and understood between all of them. Welcome to Ashes Pathfinders, your dedicated and trusted Ashes of Creation podcast. Join us as we share in the journey that reignites the embers and rekindles the flames in the hearts of those long left to cinder. I'm your host, Phoenix, also known as Samorg. I'm joined today by my returning Pathfinder and fellow companion, the Ashen Herald, Daedalus. Hello, everyone. I like saying Daedalus, the Ashen Herald. That totally flows better. I'm gonna go with it that does. next time. Hey, I did try it, man. I gotta try it different ways, you know. You can Hey, I like it. It's 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 coming <laughs> together, my friend. Yo, homies. I already see a ho- bunch of homies in chat too. It's fantastic. It's good to see y'all. But before we dig in, as always, we gotta give a shout to the home of this podcast, which is asheshq.com, the community curated website for all things Ashes of Creation. Also, a shout out to all of the Imperial Flames, which are the supporters here on Twitch, YouTube, and Patreon. Thank you so much for keeping this community's flames bolstering greater week after week, friends. And you see the links in chat. I'm telling you, if you can't see it on YouTube and you're watching it there, we love you all the same, but you just don't get the same thing if you're not here when we're live. So definitely encourage you to be here if you can live on Sundays at 5 p.m. CDT, because then you can see what we're talking about in chat. And speaking of chat, a bunch of the homies in chat probably noticing something a little different, which I'll talk about shortly. You want to show this show some love, do you? Well... You could go over to the pinned post on our Twitter, which is at Ashes Pathfinder over on Twitter. Go over there. You'll see the pinned post with all the podcast places and that iTunes one specifically could use a little love. You go over there, you follow it, you get over there, you listen. More importantly, you leave a five star review. And if you do leave a comment, we'll read it here live right on this daggum podcast. I dare somebody to go leave an epic one that sounds glorious. I dare you. I don't know if you will, though, but but I dare you. Okay, you can uh, call in to 1-539-664-6801 to leave a voice message. We'll play that here live on the show, obviously, as long as it's appropriate. What else can you do here? Hmm, hmm, hmm. You can shoot a message over to the mailbag. Ashes Pathfinder gmail.com. Pathfinder Grunt will get that to us sometime when their lazy ass is good and ready because you know how grunts are. And um, yeah, if you uh, want to support this podcast, I'm going to be doing, I believe this week is actually the week because I've been chipping away at the bit doing other things, but Patreon's going to get updated. The people that are Patreon supporters are going to be getting shout outs at the end of the podcast on video content, all kinds of stuff and things. So. If you're interested, look for the announcement this week. Knights of the Phoenix, we are recruiting. We are a community-based guild. It is literally the spearhead of this greater community, both the one here on Twitch, over on YouTube, Ashes HQ, Pathfinder Podcast. You get the point. This community, right? If you like the vibes, you dig it, you think you might be want to be a part of it, then just hit me up on Discord. Um, let's see. I did say that there was a bit of an update to people here in chat. Way overdue, long overdue, but if you've been a supporter here on Twitch, we capped at about 12 months, and uh, what can I say? I've been a busy guy, but I got a guy. They knocked it out. All the damn badges out. The 10 years are done. 
So you don't have to worry about me being late on that, which means every six months past one year, it changes, it evolves. And yes, it might be turning into a phoenix at some point. I guess you just got to get far enough along. And it's going to be interesting to see who it is that ends up reaching it first. I, I, I'm pretty sure Night Scream is going to be the one that's going to actually hit it. Hit it, And I, I don't think she's far off. My brother Shazad probably is getting close to. Um, but... So we got new emotes. I'm going to be doing some bit badges soon. I'm going to be doing some tier badges. We are going to also uh, be doing some other fun things around the community here in the near future. But we got a new game guide up. And I got to give a shout out to y'all because I was actually really shocked at how much love the most recent game guide got, right? The events game guide we put out this week, literally two days ago. I was like looking today and I'm like, oh my God, it's got like, Yo, it's like one of the best things y'all can do, man, for a content creator or a community hub like Ashes HQ is go to the content. And even if you're like, hey, I know this stuff, like uh, it's not new news to me. Like I've been listening and watching this show. Y'all keep me in the know. You might be like, so I don't really have anything to, you know, say about something I already know. But if you go over there and you like it, you leave a comment, you share your thoughts, right? Maybe you engage with other people, it bumps it up in the algorithm, and then the videos get more views, which isn't all about the views, but the community and the channel grows. So if you appreciate the Ashes HQ, this podcast, and, well, quite frankly, everything we're doing here for the Ashes community, and you feel like it's a beneficial resource, that is the number one way you could do something absolutely free to help it thrive, even Mo Beta. So literally everybody who's been over there, you know, checking out those videos, we've been like just literally chopping away at lately. Like shout out to all y'all. It's greatly appreciated. It means a lot and it helps immensely. So thank you so much for the support. Okay. Sim's done with all his like rambling and like promoting and all his like stuff and things. And is he though? Well, we, we hit on pretty much everything, I think. But um, yeah, I don't know. What, there was one thing that I noticed that was uh, different, but that's not, but that, I don't know if that's really important. And I don't know if that was really a purposeful segue. I, that, I think it is. I think the community would like to know what? why the, hmm? the redness is now just centered in the right behind you <laughs> with the blue and the purple. Cause the red still wanted to come out. It's purple. What red? The red, no red. The red still wanted to come out that the red, um the pool of redness that always occurs around the like bottom area it's showing you like uh, the dark overlord rising from the ashes it's a it's a it's a false narrative thing you know it's a false narrative and and, and sirena i'm just gonna tell you like when we first started at this setup what that was literally the first thing i noticed i'm like he's <laughs> he's trying to hide what's going on down there what? No, no, no. There's no high. Look, number one, can we talk about the color thing? I, I don't know if there's this is really like, is this is this podcast worthy for people? I mean, it, I'm going to let people in, yeah, I'm going to let the people in chat decide if they're like, no, we're talking about this. Then we'll talk about it. But I don't really think I mean, they're here for ashes of creation. They're not here to talk about Sims background. Like I mean, color. Yeah, dark overlord rising from the ashes. I think that's that's podcast relevant. I would I would say. Well, but the thing is, OK, about the red is uh talk about it in chat i mean you are the key <laughs> it's rather suspicious for sure it's not sim worthy <laughs> okay fine look i just wanted look it, I, just, I i was feeling like i don't even feel like what why are you laughing so much daedalus i haven't even begun to talk about it you're already like dying because no, i was it. thinking about what i said before the podcast i said <laughs> it wouldn't be sunday night without a rose you it's know true. what i'm saying look man okay um yeah i did do it on purpose right because i was tired of the bullshit that i gotta deal with from y'all people in chat trying to say that i'm a dark overlord trying to say things like i'm a ninja looter trying to say things like next thing you know all of my emotes are going to turn into something dark and ominous too i don't i mean i'm not saying that's going to happen i'm just saying uh what if it did? What if that happened? I don't know that that's likely to happen. I mean, you do soon. have a guy, dude. Uh, you do have a guy. Yeah, they definitely aren't um, contracted to do anything else right now. Um, anima animated emotes are coming. 
by the way. So all of the people that are like tier one and you know what you're, I'm not expecting anybody to like sub as a result or anything, but it's just, it's, I, I wanted to make sure I give y'all like a, you know, give you as much fun stuff that you can use to, to kind of like, you know, engage in chats. It's kind of the thing on Twitch. That's what we do here. We, you know, we entertain, we engage with the people in the community that are here as a part of this. And, uh, the animated emotes, I've only got the one hammer right now, and I feel like we need one. Like, I was thinking, like, a torch up, because help carry the torch. I thought I thought that would be cool. Um, definitely in the post show today, if you are you want to, like, contribute your thoughts to ideas for emotes, etc., just stay tuned after the podcast for the post show. We'll chat about it. I'll take your feedback. Um, if you say anything about Dark, Dark Overlord, I'll ban you in chat. I'm just kidding. Um Look, I just wanted to lighten the mood a little bit, right? Because I knew going into this that there was going to be a bunch of like lies and slander, like like weighed against me yet again, unjustly and unfairly. And it seemed like the only thing to do was to just lighten it up, so y'all were less likely to come at me. And yet, within only the first minutes, here we are yet again. And by the way, the red in the background, while many of you actually think or assume, like many of you are doing that that's a dark overlord thing actually my name is phoenix phoenixes are all over the channel it's part of a branding thing red in the background aligns with that so it's a damn shame you all didn't see this shameful really yeah that's all there is to that unbelievable basil's not here today obviously feels bad man he's off on a contract a gig he'll be gone for a while but friends I, I'm going to say this live, okay? I talked about it with the guys earlier this year. My homies, basically, it's like Pasha, Faisal, Half Till, who we miss, by the way, homie. Looking forward to having you on again down the road when when uh, life permits again. But, um, yeah, I was talking to them about, like, trying to find, like, one or two more homies. Basically, cast member Pathfinders that could be part of the show. Also, maybe periodically right i have a couple ideas in mind but if you're interested you don't have to be a content creator you just got to be a homie with some ideas love for ashes a working camera and and um the most important requirements you can't say anything about dark or overlord stuff you actually have to work with my narrative and you have to listen to what i say okay you can't listen to these people i'm just kidding that last part's focus so you so you're trying to recruit like you know <laughs> followers for your dark overlord army i got it <laughs> this is all we need is armored cell to be here and it'd be like sounds like cult behavior to me like <laughs> okay okay enough about the the nonsense okay the background is pure and just like me anyway moving forward man it's good to have you all here homies we are clearly going to be picking up today with the q a why does it feel like every other thing i say is like rhyming is that just me it's happening isn't it it's, it's happening it, it's you talking about poetry earlier before the show that's what it is this you is true planted this the seed and i'm like oh um Really interesting feedback um, on the past Ashes talk with some of the theories uh, around the stuff and things over on uh, what we talked about. Like during the, um, well, essentially during our last podcast, we talked about the lady in the sand who looked like a queen or a deity. And I was like, seems like it could be a deity. Remember how I was saying it looks like it's that one alien queen, but I can't remember her name. Well, Mr. Bach over on, uh, well, actually, Mr. Bach DM'd me on Discord, messaged about it on YouTube as well. So shout out to you, homie, because I know you watch the podcast every week. Um, and uh, yeah, they were, he was like, they, I'm not sure, but was like Lady of the Rose. That's the name. And I was like, thank you. Thank you, homie. I actually remember talking about this with you all on one of the live streams, not, I think, probably like three or four weeks. It was probably before their, uh, before their actual last developer live stream. But we're going to look at that and we're going to pick up on the q and I got some some community oriented discussions, things I've noticed in the uh, Greater Ashes of Creation community that seemed like they'd be a good idea to talk about here live on the show today. Um, I don't know, man. We, we left off on the show last week, Daedalus, talking about uh, the gate locations. And I think tying this into the Lady of the Rose, and then we can get to the QA after, follow up on the community stuff maybe after. I feel like that's a good flow. Um, so Lady of the Rose, there it is, right? And I'm going to actually read this. And this reinforces my idea around, remember the Ayla humans? 
right? When they, when we come back in the MMORPG, you're returning to Vera. You, you're now two, basically two lesser races, two of the, two of the more sub races, right? They've split off and culturally they've changed, right? They've evolved differently over thousands of years. And you have the Valoon and you have the Kalar humans. Okay. And they, they came from the Ayla humans, right? That was the essentially parent race, right? Before the two sub races essentially, um, sort of split and, you know, went their own cultural directions. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, Lady of the Rose, that totally hits the mark. And remember how we talked last week? I said, you know, that would actually make sense too, right? Because, you know, the desert there, if she's in the desert, like maybe it wasn't desert back in the day, thousands of years, lots of things can change. And I mean, this to me totally aligns. I'm going to read this blurb for you. You know, I thought, remember was, because we were talking about that, and then I, we went from that to it seems like the Riverlands was looking very human. We got the concept art for the Aelin City that we were thinking it looks like it's probably the Riverlands. The Riverlands are to the northwest on the map of where the desert area is at. So I'm like, okay, so if this is Lady of the Rose, like, and this is like the queen, it makes sense that it would be a queen. And it makes sense that it would be an important figure for multiple reasons, not only before the Exodus, but after even returning. Right. Um, and the Veiloon have that sigil, right? That, it, you know, it seems like it would probably align with the, the sigil on her, on her crown or her helmet. So I'm going to read this and I feel pretty confident this is actually it. I, I really, I genuinely do here. Okay. And if you go and look at the, this, a cost cosmetic uh, skin that came out formed by the wise Aelin queen. As she foresaw the impending darkness, the order of the still bloom consisted of specially selected knights, strong of heart and valor. The order was essential in carrying out nigh impossible endeavors of critical importance during the last days of Vera under the direction of the beloved and revered lady of the rose, when the divine gates opened, at great personal risk to her own safety, the queen ordered her protection to leave her side and make haste to the bright hold to ensure the success of the light pack's crucial mission. The order would not return from the command. Right? So this was a great sacrifice in, in multiple ways, not only for her order, um, clearly for the light pact in the lore of Ashes of Creation, um, we know a lot about the light pact. We've, we've talked about them a lot here. Um, but that, that like aligns for me to me, that is my, I'm pretty, I'm pretty concrete on this because Steven didn't actually mention anything. He said lady of the sand or something like that. He didn't say anything about deity, anything like that, that would actually give me an indication. Um, that's a good question, by the way, narrow in chat said, how long did the exodus take from beginning to end? And that's a good question. I don't think we've got a very solid timeline on that. We've got very vague uh, plot points for the timeline itself. We do not have dates, specific dates, periods of time. Even when you go and you look at the lore for Ash as a creation and you literally look at like, OK, so the order of the seven, remember, the seven deities are the seven out of the ten from that celestial fight at that point in time in the past when three of the ten were trying to essentially, or not trying, they taught the ancients the way of the essence, right? Mm -hmm. Essentially, right. that's a no-no, okay? So whenever they decided to teach them that, celestial war ensued, right? The three that taught it plus the ancients, poof, out into the void. Bye, see ya. You're gone. The seven, right, deities continue to remain in their dominion, and the Order of Seven clearly, um, you know, is, is essentially paying tribute to these deities. Um, you're going to often probably find all seven as churches in the game, a religion that you can uh, be a part of in Ashes of Creation. And the Order of the Seven formed the Light Pact. We don't have a date. We don't know when. We just know the Light Pact was out there trying to prepare the Divine Gateways. I think there's probably going to be a lot of really good lore around the Goddess of Creation of Fate specifically as they relate to the 
the Order of the Seven, the Light Pact, the Exodus, all that stuff, the gateways and all that. But details? Nah, man. We don't have enough information. We got the we've got the general, this is what happened, but we don't have the time periods in which it all happened and everything. I would uh be pretty shocked if if uh uh, you know what her order the order of the steel bloom were doing didn't go on for a while i could also see like her hands being up as potentially holding like a a bloom or something right that would actually kind of work for me like some sort of like a, a blossom or, or something of that nature that could have been there maybe it's not now we didn't see anything in her hands we saw sand flowing out of it who knows what that yeah which about. could be the whatever she was holding deteriorating to which or the they made a point of yeah. like having that other than it may be looking cool. Maybe there's some more meaning there. True. There it is. That's my theory. And I think it's, uh, I mean, it makes a lot of sense if that were her, um, especially around that time. Um, just because, you know, that's like towards the end. If she was, she's raining, makes sense that there's a statue over there. Makes sense when you come back, it's there. Oh man, I see some stuff in there. Oh, there's a there's a reference point. Um, oh man, that's such an unfair comparison. I'm cringing. Yeah, right there in chat about it's like Camelot and Chain they get you hyped and it will never be finished. Yeah, the the difference between um, Camelot Unchained and Ashes of Creation is um, Ashes of Creation's got all the funding it needs because the uh, the CEO and creative director is a wealthy person who has plenty of money to do this and has seen it all the way through. Right, I say plenty because clearly the commitment's there and it's going to happen. Doesn't doesn't require Kickstarter backers or funding outside of them, which means they're not beholden to board. Um, and yeah, and you also have them using an engine that's killing it right now. It's going to be around for a long time. Yeah, there's a lot of reasons. It's not even a a very rational, or realistic comparison. But and I cover Camelot Unchained occasionally along with a lot of other MMORPGs. So yeah, I make a lot of those, uh, a lot of those references around that particular game. It's a damn shame. Is that, is what that is. Then you got the ones that are out there, the scam starters that I call them of our time, but that's a, that's a topic for another time. Thankful ashes is not in that. Um, yeah. In that category. Um, so there's the vestiges of the still bloom, right? Um, let's, let's take a look, man, over some of the, Q and A stuff, right? I'm going to go ahead and share the link here in chat, and this is from our last developer live stream from July 29th. We were looking at this last week. We went over a lot of the points, talking about um, the Tolnar, right? We looked at some of the new character. Um, uh, concepts well i guess i mean let's be fair right they're already they've already got this stuff in character models that are that are there at this point so we just haven't gotten to see them yet but they got to show us the uh the, the empyrean elf and the renkai orc we got a lot of other cool things we have the tool the landform tool that was showcased um yeah but the q a we're going to go down the list and then we're going to get to some fun discussions community-oriented discussion. So if you hear me chatting about um, any of these questions and points and you've got something, feel free to at me in chat. I want to actually pull a little bit from chat. Also, anybody that's watching this now or you're watching it on YouTube, you're curious about Ashes, I want everybody to remember one fundamentally important thing that's different about Ashes of Creation compared to a lot of the MMORPGs that are out there, right? the barrier to entry is extremely low in comparison, right? There's no box cost. I'm not saying this to sell it. This is just real talk. You, you don't have to pay a box cost, right? You literally can sub to the game the, when this thing finally go, goes live in the next, what I anticipate to be a couple years, give or probably give or take, I'd say probably a year and a half to two years more than likely, but yeah. right. You can, you can literally wait till this thing launches, pay the subscription fee, you don't have to back anything. You don't have to support anything. You can literally chill and wait, check it out when it's live. You pay 15 bucks. You play the hell out the game for a month. And if you like it, you continue. It's just 15 months. That's a sub, sub fee. That's it. You know, I mean, the barrier to entry compared to traditional MMORPGs. I mean, even Blizzard right now, it's still the same old thing. You're still paying another expansion. 
paying the subscription fee every month. I mean, it's like the same old, same old with, with Blizz and some other games out there. Um, yep. Let's get into the Q&A, man. Will mobs knock down and knock back mounted players off their mounts? They said there's a danger of traversing or to traversing areas with enemies nearby. There are specific abilities that knock a rider off their mount should they venture too close to enemies. This is good. Like, this is the same kind of thing we talked about. We have, you know, they can impact you on your mount. They can catch you when you're stealthing, maybe. Like, there are going to be... Uh, skills and abilities that the NPCs in the game are going to have, and they'll catch you. So you've got to be cautious, not only of other players, but clearly of the environment and the, the NPCs that exist in it, right? Um, there's not a lot to say about that other than I'm just really glad that that's the case. Um, I think it's kind of like silly to me when you've got a game where you could just be stealth, like World of Warcraft's like this, obviously, right? You can be stealth and you can just walk right by somebody or an NPC and and literally not get caught unless you get like really close to them but you know with ashes like it's like nah you're not going to be able to get that kind of close you're going to still need to be cautious from a distance like watch your proximity you know i don't think you're going to be getting away with like creeping up right behind somebody and not not like raising an alarm of some sort to some yeah i mean unless their back is turned i can see where that makes sense but if they're looking Mm -hmm. at you head on yeah i definitely see that in players or npcs and I do like the fact mm. that, um, you know, you have to be more careful even when you're on your mount, like riding by mobs, too. Because um, I know something that um, that Blizzard game does is like you can buy something and it you don't that isn't a problem anymore. Nobody can knock you off your mount. Right. Or at least NPC wise, which um, I think is kind of a, a cop out. It's what, you know, people use to farm herbs It's like, oh, you need to get this in chance. So you don't get knocked off your mount or whatever. Uh, Maybe it's an item you you need to attach to some to, to boots or whatever. But I, I like the fact that there's you know there's mm-hmm. got to be some good choices you got to make. You just yeah. can't go you know yolo into a group of mobs on your mountain and expect to not be knocked over or knocked down. Right. This is going to be a fun one to chat about a bit. Um, with the recent updates we've seen in to combat, has the team decided if there will be a global cooldown or not? Said yes, but this is something that will be tested in Alpha 2 and how global cooldowns are categorized across different types of abilities. Let's just take a moment to talk about global cooldowns. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, like them, love them, necessary, uh, overkill sometimes. Like, where do you, what's your general like perspective on the use of global cooldowns? Maybe best practices, if you will. I mean, to me, it's all about balance. I mean, you can't necessarily, I mean, I, I'm not a fan of no global cooldown um, because that creates opportunities for people to create like I win macros yeah. and so on, right? Without that. Um, so there's some pacing to it. And I do like the fact, I, but on the other hand, if it's overused, right, then it really kind of kills like your pacing, your time to kill, right? It doesn't, I think it's just as like uh, detrimental to making meaningful choices in terms of your combat moves as it is having no global cooldown. So I think I'm all about balance here. I mean, if maybe the more weighty ones generate a global cooldown, so you have to be more judicious in terms of like using those bigger abilities in succession mm-hmm. besides having like a normal cooldown, which I expect there that's going to be the case too. But I think it does help balance out like a level of strategy. And I like the fact that they're, you know, whenever they have a decision, it's like, but we're going to yeah. test this, right? We have an idea, but we're going to test this. Yeah. And so that way it just makes me feel like hope, you know, the fact that they're already like looking at this in alpha two is good. Right. Um, As opposed to being like more of a fine tuning thing they do in beta. Yeah, I definitely think that global cooldowns are extremely important as well as diminishing returns. Um, I think when you add like. I think whenever a game is like super rigid on having cooldowns for too many things, it tends to feel I don't know, I tend to not really enjoy it. I like instant cast abilities. Um, but I think that there's like a balance between those types of abilities that are like your instant cast. You can use them all the time, 
you can literally spam the same button over and over, but there's like a reason that doing that's not going to be very efficient. You know, like maybe it's going to burn a lot more mana. Maybe you're um, not going to um, be pr- putting a debuff on a target to where using that skill is going to be more influential. Um, for example, like if I'm going to do like an extra 10,000 damage or something, you know, because I've got, uh, I've used two of my other skills and I put sort of a debuff on it. And now hitting that ability after getting the debuff on there makes some sense or situationally makes sense to be utilized. Like then having like no cooldown, like that's totally fine. Right. But yeah, the things that are, the things that are literally going to have like a lot of power, I think, yeah, you definitely want to have that there to sort of like limit, like how frequently you can use that. But it's not like every, it's not cookie cutter, right? It's not every like super powerful ability should have one. It's not like every cast ability should have one. Um, Cause some cast abilities, like, you know, that could be the cost to the benefit analysis in itself. Right. Um, so it's different, but um, you know, I think a lot of times whenever we we think about global cooldowns, we we think about how you have to wait for everything to be used. Um, uh, there's definitely a balance to that, right? And I think that's where diminishing terms, uh, diminishing returns, sort of acts as like a really good counterweight to something like global global cooldowns, um, along with a variety of different types of skills and abilities. Where you've got like the castable type, you've got like range or melee, you know, the different kind of variations, ones that are aligning more with. Uh, uh like your weapon specifically versus like maybe just a school of magic you're using um it just really depends on what they're going for and that's it's really such a hard thing to be able to give feedback on at this point which is i think probably why they didn't have a very big answer for this question um because until you get to a place where you're essentially putting this into people's hands or able to really test it out um extensively uh, with this like idea of what your vision for your combat system is going to actually be it having an answer for that's like, I think it would be, a, I think, I think it could sort of like <clears throat> put you in a box to where now you have to like, make sure you don't break your word or whatever your answer is, but you don't really want to do that if you're not really sure where it's going to be utilized yet because you're still working on the system. So yeah, this is interesting. Will there be a cap on how many times an animal can be bred in animal husbandry? Shout out to my homies who are playing on our ARC server right now where you can tame and breed creatures, raise little little animals, right? All the stuff and things. It's, it's going to give us a, <clears throat> a bit of a taste at least for what animal husbandry could be. This was um, interesting when talking about the cap on how many times you can breed an animal husbandry. He said, Yes, there will be a cap, absolutely. That cap is defined by the types of animals, the quality of the animal, and for what purpose it is being used in the animal husbandry system. Okay, so animal type and quality, purpose for it being used in the system. What is the, What do you hear when you, when you hear that? Well, that first one makes me wonder what do you mean like in inter- I mean I know what he means in terms of quality mm-hmm. but what does that mean for the breeding meaning right if I have like a common creature for example can I breed that very in, in a very limited way I mean I'm kind of thinking it's probably the opposite like if it's common you can get a lot of mileage out of it <laughs> Sorry, it's the, it made me go somewhere in my head, but yeah, I went there uh, too. I'm pretty sure we might be in the same place. And I'm like, oh shit! But but a like a rare creature, right, has like a much more um, short shelf life in terms of being able to to utilize. And then again, like when he says types, okay, so you might have like farm animals mm-hmm. versus maybe more combat more mount mounted ones with special abilities and kind of feel like they're going to go and err on the side of rarity being like the more rare it is the less opportunity you have to mass produce it that's would be my gut knowing Mm. that they want to go for like generally like as a catalyst for you know player agency Mm -hmm. um meaningful conflict right and scare scarcity of resources so that's the way i would go with it um I would expect, though, like things that where you're 
maybe resource gathering would be generally more common because if people have freeholds and whatnot, um, then they would, but, or maybe there's like um, creatures that as you're harvesting, if they have an opportunity to get like rare items, those are the ones that are going to be more rare. So they're still like that again, that category and, and I guess um, quality that, I guess that would be like what I'm mm -hmm. thinking. Like when I think about that is that, um, you're going to have uh, a limited shelf life on the more rare stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that would make a lot of sense too. And I, I one thing I actually like though, is that like you, you go and you tame a creature. It, it's a limited time for breeding is what I'm, you know, in some regard. Right. Which means, I mean, in games like arc, for example, which it's a very different game fair. Okay. But it's still a really good snapshot of, of an animal husbandry system. Right. You tame them. You can euthanize the ones that like, you know, maybe don't have the qualities and traits you want. Um, what? <laughs> what? Wow. I did not <laughs> think we were going to go to euthanization here. On this. You can put them down. What are you going to do in ashes when you tame a bunch of creatures? You're going to have to put them somewhere. Right. Eventually, you're going to have to, like, delete the thing. Right. When it's reached its usefulness. Oh, God. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I wouldn't oh. do that. I would. I would sell them or give them away to a, wait, wait, a caring you know, owner versus uh, euthanizing those not poor animals. Like, <laughs> Daedalus is like, I wouldn't do that. Here's what I do. Check out my yeah. Lightbringer vibes here. Okay. Yeah, okay. I was just just dark Overlord talking no. about putting people no. out of their misery. No, I was just referencing Ark. You no dove into that no. one like Greg Luganus. <laughs> okay, all right. I'm just saying that happened. Damn it. Okay, let me try to explain. I'm just no really explanation. You can do this in Ark, okay? You got too many, you put them down. You breed the ones that got the traits you want. But I do like the idea of having a higher quality animal. Like that's, and like not being able to do that very frequently. And it's like, okay, you know, at some point, what do you do then, right? You go, which actually, that's a good, that's kind of a curious idea. What if. I'm curious about this, right? Like, I'm very curious about the limits on taming and trading. Like, if I tame something and I trade it, but it, can, it, can it still then be bred with by someone else who's an animal husbandry? Like, that's actually kind of interesting, right? I mean, I would think if they have similar paths in terms of skill, they could. But right. I think that's going to be the barrier to entry, right? Sure. Is if you get something and it's, fairly advanced in terms of what breeding skill it's required. I wouldn't expect somebody would be able to replicate it unless they have that same skill. I think that's the way I could expect like resource scarcity being like another layer there, mm -hmm. as opposed to being like, Hey, I've got this, like, I don't know, legendary creature and it has X, Y, Z ability, right? I can maybe breed it like say, just for argument's sake, five times. And so not only is that resource scarcity going to be, you know, a driver for the demand and, and you know, what the, or sorry, the uh, driver for the supply and essentially what you could get it in terms of market value, it still would be, have that other layer of skill on top of that. And that's, I guess that's the way I would, I would look at it because you're just very similarly to like a master blacksmith. Um, Damn it. <laughs> Damn it. I saw the clip come through. <laughs> oh my god, dude. Look, I was talking about art. Come on, man. Give me a break here. I'm not talking about euthanizing creatures and ashes because of dark intentions. I'm just talking about how you would uh never not gonna go there. No, that was that, that was just gonna be a part two. No. <laughs> I was like, if I say what I'm thinking, someone's gonna say sacrifice. Someone's gonna be like dark cult or something. I didn't even I didn't even say it and he went already went there like he knew. Yeah, I because I, I felt the vibe coming my way through the through the Discord. There's man. no vibes. Saying, there's, there's no the vibe. vibe. <laughs> Don't say Better that. turn those lights up there to red, that man. I will. I will not. I will not turn to the dark side. But if my emotes turn to the dark side, it might mean something one day. But what do we consider dark side emotes, really? Is a color change to just red and black actually constitute dark sim vibes if that were to happen? I don't think so. It's just wearing two colors. Okay. The colors themselves are innocent. 
Yeah, right. I'm, I'm thinking maybe you'll an animated emote with, you know, your dark overlord garb and some glowing, you know, <laughs> corrupted eyes. That might that might work. <laughs> you know what I to do? I don't make an animated, animated emote where I'm like, hey, I got a smile on my face. I just pull up skulls on a a bunch of skulls on like a. You know. Do one of those things where you're smiling and then do that whole serial killer like look at you stuff. Oh no. <laughs> There's a clip out, out there somewhere of me doing this or whatever, and people are like, I forgot what they called it. Um but yeah, they were trying to say something uh that wasn't true. Okay. How about this one? Will we be able to fly flags on ships such as coats of arms indicating an association to guilds nodes of their group, such as pirates? I'm so sad that Glumberg didn't get his question answered. I mean, it might be in the I have to go look at the post because normally whenever questions didn't mm -hmm. get answered on the stream, they go back. So I'd like to see if they did answer that because that was mm -hmm. a good question. He had. That was a good one. Their answer, though, is it will not likely be a flag-based system, but there will be the opportunity to utilize unique emblems and custom images on their cells, as well as certain locations on the hall for name or the hole for names and emblems and as a decal. The emblem system, man, this is going to be your thing for your guilds, for your guild halls and fortresses, um, probably for like ships and things like that. I'm kind of hoping we get to see it on caravans too. That would be kind of interesting. Um, mm -hmm. The modular design tells me that it's going to be likely we're going to see that utilized in a lot of different places. Um, yeah, and I'm hoping that it'll be like that, too, for like, you know, tabards and, and all the different barding and things like that. Um, maybe not initially right away, because I know some things are going to be applicable early on. Um, but to expand into that later is just going to be like would be fantastic. Um, yeah, I'm I'm wondering like because they had talked back and forth about um like what they mm -hmm. might do with custom images. So I'm wondering what they mean by that. Is that something like you can build in something internal into the like actual game, or is it something you can externally upload? Because mm -hmm. I think having any type of bureaucracy around that is going to be a lot of resources. So I would be interested to see what they meant by like custom images or if it's something that you can customize in some sort of UI. Yeah. I think it would be cool to have that in like a UI of sorts. Mm -hmm. You know, World of yeah, Warcraft same. had that system of like emblems that was in their game. And I'm like, ah, oh, can we just upload just one? Like, I mean, clearly like, you know, filter out like the penises and stuff that people are going to try to upload like obviously but it would be super cool to be able to have like like maybe just maybe as like a like even as like a player or just like as a guild master or something to have like a few that you can upload that maybe it takes some time for them to improve but when they do it's like even having a cool down on like the next time you can upload one again just to kind of keep it you know to where it's easier for them to manage but yeah, I think it'd be really cool to have that or even like a variety of like like crests and things, right? Like a couple different variations. That'd be sick. Cuz I mean, yeah. the way I look at it is they love modular, man. It would be yeah. great to be able to kind of like have that on from an emblem standpoint. It's like you might be able to like mix and match different pieces mm -hmm. like you would. I mean, I would I could totally see that happening, but again, that's a lot of extra effort i would imagine to um to be able to do that so yeah, maybe absolutely. i mean i don't know if they could do something like they did with landform where you can like make things so easy maybe there's a way they can do that too just you know mm -hmm. obviously more pipe dreamy but still yeah i think long term i could see something like that being possible with ashes the modular design man i mean i don't know how many times we've actually talked about this a lot yeah you know and i mean like every every time they continue through their development they get to a point where they show off more things it's like here's how our systems work and you're like it's all modular everything is like this this sort of like at least from my perspective is from this approach of like a plug and play sort of you know like dynamic to where it's interchangeable sort of things like very modular based. I mean, we see it with the caravans. We're seeing it with the emblem system. We're seeing it with some of the uh, gearing. You know, I'm, I'm, I'd be shocked if we didn't see the same thing sort of apply uh, in terms of like that design philosophy with the uh, the the stat blocks that crafters are going to have agency over. So, yeah. 
Pipe Dreamy sounds like a Gandalf thing. <laughs> <laughs> How about this one? Okay. We got, we know that party raid guild ally mates can't flag against each other. Right. But what if one of them is a PKer? Can your guild mate help remove corruption by killing you? Are we ready? Currently, yes. The affiliation between guilds or citizenships is trumped by your status condition of corrupt and any player can kill a corrupt player. But that will also be tested in Alpha 2. Even if you're capable of killing your friends, there are unique abilities in the bounty hunter systems that locate individuals on the map, and thus there will always be that tense anxiety as you are facilitating a kill from other players. I, when he said that live, I was like, ooh, there are going to be so many guilds that are going to break up over this. Right? Because we already know, like, I did that Castles, I think it was Castles or Nodes or whatever, recently did a game guide and talked, oh, it's the guilds one, and I talked about how, like, your citizenship trumps your guild. Right? But this is, like, your flag Literally, you're flagging based on your behavior as a player trumps all that. Right? Someone goes corrupt, you're you're open season, regardless. Yes. Yeah, the, the dark side, you know, does have its drawbacks. Yes, it does. This is why I always encourage people not to go dark side or corrupt because um well, there's a, a certain murder bunny that hops around in Vera. Um Goes by the name of uh, was it Faisal, right? Right? Yeah. You know, there's movies about this guy. Faisal goes west. Yeah, be careful, man. You know, just be cautious. Comes from the east. Murder bunny. It's a real thing, right? He probably won't hop in ashes, but just know that that's a that's a real person we talk about. You, ne you never know. There is a jump button. <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine though I, do you think if we asked Faisal like role play a bunny for us real quick when he gets some footage he'd do it you probably would, he would probably yeah. do it wouldn't he yeah he would oh my gosh you know oh, what a really good competition would be in the future when ashes is out challenging everybody in the community to create their best murder murder bunny outfit and role play jumping around like you're out in the wild doing your thing <laughs> And then we could take like the different clips and show them off here live and then like have the audience vote. Right. And then award somebody with like some sick loot from the Hall of Righteousness. It's right back there. Everybody. Some pilfered loot from the Hall of Righteousness. Got it. <laughs> this is where I go to block out the couch because there's a whole nother narrative there that we don't need to talk about right now. Okay. <clears throat> this, I mean, this issue with being able to remove corruption i i mean i get the upside i just think there's potential for ex exploitation yeah. here um which is i mean again you know they're testing it in alpha 2 which is good but still i mean i would say um i honestly feel like and i don't know how they would do this but i think the penalty mm -hmm. should be worse if you get killed by a guildmate I, I think that that way somehow mm. it's like it's a deterrent for them doing that. Like, Ooh. hey, dude, I need to clear my corruption. You can't just call a friend to jack you up. Right. Because that's even more. And you can't. And I don't know. I think trading is limited. Right. But how because you're going to take this, this whatever the stat hit is from the corruption, but you'll lose some gear, too. Mm. And I do like the fact that, like, if there is bounty hunters there, I mean, that's somewhat of a check. But. Yeah, I mean, what are the odds like, you know, you don't have a spot where you can go that's far enough off, you know, that you can have your guildy just, you know, bat you across the face so you can just get rid of your corruption. So I, I, I think this is going to be one that I would want to watch pretty closely and see if there's like any other deterrence from making this a thing people would do. I mean, I'm all for if you've got a guild mate. Um, that goes against your code of conduct and lights justice reigns, but I, I would not. Right, um, I, I would I would not feel comfortable unless there was like some other like methodology there to 
stop people from using it as a, a way to get out of being hunted for their misdeeds. Yeah, I'm still pretty. It just when look, I, I'm I'm cool with the fact that like corruption's a thing. You know what I mean? I think it's a good deterrent to griefing. Um, <clears throat> I do think about a conversation that we had, and I can't remember if it was on this show or post show or just one of the one of the the ashes talks that I'll have here on the channel sometimes. But I remember talking about how like. In the beginning, right, like when people are starting to play the game or even in, you know, those like earlier areas of the game, especially launch, right? You're not going to be able – You're. it would be, from my perspective, like a deviation from the vision to launch the game and then turn off corruption for a while because of the fact that, like, you don't want people to be griefing right out the gate and then potentially stop people from playing or even bothering at all, Right. Because the that that idea of like, hey, we're gonna start playing, but everybody's griefing everybody right in the beginning, and it's a big old gank fest, and people got corruption, and it's just going back and forth and back and forth. Like that is going to happen. Like that's gonna actually be going. I mean, there's gonna be people that right off the right out the gate are gonna be like, I'm gonna do this. And you don't have you don't have bounty hunters to hunt them either in the beginning, right? Because you can't do that till the military node gets to a certain level, right? So no bounty hunters will be able to come and take these people out. It'll be relied specifically on killing them, okay? And you got a lot of people that are getting griefed. You might be like, I don't know if I feel like playing right now. So, yeah. That first initial snapshot, like, there's going to be people that are griefing so freaking hard. It's going to be extremely annoying to a lot of people. You know, because like I think of myself, like I'm probably just going to try to like level. Yeah, it's at like level three, right? TL for sudden chat here. But here's the thing, right? How long is that actually going to take in the live version of the game? I mean, I honestly yeah. think like if the cap or what I think at some point they said the cap was like, what, 50? Um, At least that's what they had. Level cap, uh, yeah. yeah, level cap was yeah. 50. I mean, I wouldn't be opposed to having like some sort of like grace period at the start, meaning like you have to get to level 10 to be able to flag. Mm -hmm. um, and and I don't know about like the other way around. So if you have like a level um, 20 player can go back and kill mm -hmm. like level threes or whatever. Right. Um, that's where I guess the corruption would kick in. But I think right out of the gate, I think to avoid the gang fest you're gonna need at least some sort of a few levels where people are kind of a you know not able to flag for pvp i don't know if 10 is the right number it may come up in testing but that would be that would be a great question frankly for the stream is just like you know no it's like how are you do you have any plans to do anything to avoid potential you know gang fests at launch for starting right. areas for people that are of that level, right? So then you're not going to get a ton of corruption by killing somebody that's your even level at level four or whatever it is. Um, so, you know, what's what's the deterrent there? And I and I, I hesitate to use the word deterrent, but mm -hmm. it's like you, you've got to have a balance. Just like with, you know, anything in the game, yes, there's got to be risk. There's, you know, risk and reward, but mm -hmm. you still have to kind of balance that out with, what's the right level of risk and when does it become like you were saying a, like a, a turnoff or a barrier to entry for players coming in that may not be as you know pvp oriented right off the rip right, right. um but yeah yeah that's a good point i mean it's something that you know because you can't ever know it's, it's sort of like the difference between a pve and a pvp server like think about World of Warcraft, right? I know this is a bit it's a bit of a like stretchy sort of like discussion point, but I feel like it's got relevance. If we think about PVE players, right? Why is it that some PVE servers don't have I was talking to my brother about this this week because he's playing classic. Like he goes into the battle group, right? And they group of battle groups there and you go in and sometimes you just got horrible PvP players. 
and you got people that just aren't even bothering with that system at all. And then you got like some battle groups where you've got like some people that are like pretty, pretty decent. And you got PVE players that are actually like engaged in PVP content. Right. So like, why is it one PVE server can have more people that are like actually engaging in PVP versus others? Like, there's no way to like really get, there's no way to predict that. Like that is literally an agency thing, like the the roll of the dice of what communities or what people chose to be on one server. And so like, you know, Nero brought up a good point. Like, you know, if someone doesn't really fight back, like then you're, you know, that's not really going to, you're not really going to have that sort of issue of going back and forth, but that's that random roll the dice, like on each server, what group of people do you have and exactly which people are going to fight back and it's going to have that happen and which aren't. It's just like there's no way to really know for sure. You know what I mean? It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And there's the other thing, too. I just thought of this as you were mentioning that comment, which is a good one um, around like the experience that component of things. Right. That could also be a way that ne- it wouldn't necessarily be a deterrent. Right. Per se for like people like ganking each other. Mm-hmm. But you would have less um, less of a penalty if you you know, don't fight back or do fight back, right? At, you know, again, up to a certain point, like I, I say level 10, right? It could be earlier, it could be a little later, whatever, mm-hmm. whatever makes sense. But that could be another way, which like, yeah, it would be inconvenient if you got ganked in the starting area mm-hmm. by someone, um, you know, that that got you. But I, I would say as long as there's no debt to kind of follow that up, I probably wouldn't be as salty about it. Mm-hmm. But knowing that at a certain point, right, it's it's going to be, you know, it's going to be the Wild West. Wild, wild west. It's a good, 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 good reference point. So how about this? Will, will Alpha 2 be feature complete before betas are launched? We obviously know that that's going to be the case. But they said, yes, it will be feature complete before beta. And I'm sitting going like, that's literally the problem. Purpose of the testing phases. Yeah, it's like betas have always got the systems, right? You're not adding new systems and any any betas. Like you're literally like testing like populations, bugs, quests, all these random things that that slip through usually like the, the earlier alpha testing phases. Um so they said um, yeah, it'll be oh go ahead. Uh, unless you're blizzard that changes oh. your class right before oh, launch. Oh dig. <laughs> oh shit. Uh, I was like, I literally, you oh, said that. And I'm like, not, every, oh. not everybody follows that definition, Sim. Oh, that's so true. <laughs> they just don't yeah, care, the, right? They used to. Yeah, like actually... I just remember. I was like, I finally got used to the Paladin and Beta and then launch. And I'm like, what the actual, you know, flippity flap is this? I just could. I had to. It took me a minute to oh a little disoriented God. with that system. Right. They, so obviously they said, yes, there'll be feature complete before beta. Beta is most, uh, mostly the identify last minute bugs, make sure that everything else is ready for launch. Alpha 2 server will remain even post launch as a test server. You know, I, I've got to take a moment to like make this dig here. Okay. Oh. Can we talk about just World of Warcraft real quick? I mean, they when they drop like an expansion and then they just make this like race, the draconic race or whatever it is. Have you seen how fast that thing flies? I haven't. Oh my god. Literally, I've I've um purged that Dude. entire expansion from my psyche. But you know, it's like we're gonna you know what? The LFM podcast is gonna be later this week, everybody. We're gonna shelf that for then. It might have been a purposeful bookmark for y'all. But Thursday at 5 p.m. Central, you're going to hear me rant about that and probably hear me rant about uh, the Diablo immortal person who spent $100,000 uh, on stuff and things and then they can't find anybody in the group with say, what? That's funny as shit, isn't it? Quick karma. Life's justice reigns, baby. Hello. All right. We'll talk Thursday. We got some fun stuff on Thursday. Okay. The larger ships have a minimum capacity required in order to be mobile. No, you only need a captain to drive the ship. However, to be effective, there is a scaling amount of additional personnel that is required on each ship type class in order to be most effective. And that skills based on the ship. Perfect. 
as it should be for naval content. Right? Agreed. Could you imagine a, a solo player rolling around in their like galleon or whatever, and they're like rolling around out there just like pummeling people with like all the all the ammunition and and all that like Sea of Thieves actually does you know does this to where like there's different things you could be doing. You could patch up the ship, you can you know pour water out, you can um you know use the cannons, you can steer it, you can mess with the sails. I'm I'm not a sailor, but if I'm gonna jump on a ship, we got a bunch of homies. Like I love that that kind of coordination will be expected. And even more so when you think about fighting a damn behemoth out in the water, like we saw that one time that we're talking about having to see like, hello, the alpha two creature things massive. You don't want to be out there at a bunch of boats with like, you know, you people need to be freaking out trying to tell different people what to do and having to manage that chaos. Yeah. I mean, it's a raid after all, right? Exactly. You can't just have like one dude, no. like, you know, kiting it and sewing it around. <laughs> right. Look at me, borderline exploiting, huh? <laughs> nah, dude. Thank, thank the way, homie. Speaking of naval content, I'm hoping we get to see something soon. I'm yeah, not, same. you know, like, I'm hoping we get to see them like out on a ship, rolling around, doing things. How's the congestion of the sea going to look with all the boats one day? I'm just curious. You know, well, if they go for a bigger map, maybe not so much. You never know. True story. It's a very, very true story. Um, should need like ten people for a galleon. I feel like that's accurate. I agree with that mm-hmm. for sure. Okay, when it comes to castle nodes and castle sieges, are the weekly node events monthly castle siege a guarantee, or is it possible that a siege or castle node event could have no challengers and they don't take place. That is a funny question to me, right? Just that, that last part. Is it possible that a siege castle note event could have no challengers and they don't take place? Okay. The answer castle sieges are on a monthly schedule. Those sieges will always occur on that schedule events and node based events are predicated on certain world conditions being met. So it is not always guaranteed that a node will suffer some type of event unless a predicate for that particle event or story arc is met within the world. Right. It makes sense that that's the case with nodes, but castles, I I mean, monthly schedule, man. You got your three weeks plus your one, right? Preparations must be made. Also, like the only time I'd see like there being no contest on any of this stuff stuff is if like a server is just dead and the game's basically not making it. That's the only reality because... Because literally, this is going to be sought after. Being a, a, you know, a castle like royalty, like monarch, like actually running a keep, or being the mayor of a node, like that's, that's like the the prestige right there. That is the pinnacle for most people, right? I want to fly a dragon around. You want to fly a dragon or a flying mount, like legit flying? It's one of your best guaranteed ways to have it. Right there. So they will be going after it all the time. I don't know that I'll ever actually fly in ashes. I don't know if I have that ambition anymore. No. I don't know if the if the people would rally around for that. But there's also like the eggs and stuff. I mean you gotta like when when you talk about that sort of stuff, like it's cool in theory. It's possible, right? It's possible we got like a night where the whole community is together. We pull people from the community. We all go do a community night. We roll up in there, raffle stomp them, and we do it. It's possible. But yeah, I'm also not planning on like making a game my full time job. It's a place to go run around and chill with the homies. It doesn't mean I won't be on there all the time either, but <laughs> you know, because uh, yeah. There's a good example of that. When I get sucked into a game, I play it a bunch. I can't help it. But that is the nature of video games, right? Does it? Can it get you? Can it pull you in? Oh, yeah. 
We're coming up on, oh my gosh, there's actually more questions than I thought. Okay, let's get to this one. When it comes to mayoral construction projects, how long will it take for a node to be built completely? The expected time from node advancement ranges from hours, wilderness to expedition, to weeks, city to metropolis, depending on the level. This is because nodes are the dials in which the world advances. What it takes for a node to advance within a single level, which includes establishing embassies or relationships with the castles or reputation with other nodes so that trade agreements can be utilized, building new types of player buildings, and put a flag on that part there about the trade agreements, right? They said that uh, it's one of the thing to get a node to a certain level, but it's another to develop that node. Because of that, there's no average time because there are so many variables, including how many citizens there are, what the type of traffic within the node based on things like tax rate, building specialization, all of which are variables which can affect the build out time for a node. If there is a particular project that the citizens want to be developed based on the node stage, they should have the ability to complete several of those projects within a single term of a mayor. So the term of a mayor is one month. Also, that point about trade agreements, I want to put a stressor on that and why this is a very important thing to remember, okay? It's not going to be as simple and I, I feel like it's important for people like really hear me on this. It's not going to be as simple as like just leveling your node via XP, right? It's not going to be that simple. You got what is the node type? What are the buildings there? What are the decisions the mayor is making? And more importantly, do the mayors engage in trade agreements? What are trade agreements, Sam? This is literally bartering with other nodes for resources, because certain areas in the world are going to have certain resources that others are not, and vice versa. And it's going to be the trade agreements that are going to allow people to go, hey, we got a bunch of ore. Hey, we got like tons of lumber and stone. Or hey, we've got specific herbs, different things. And like things that are very plentiful in one area or node are not going to probably exist at all in another one. And so these partic particular like metropolises or thriving node economic regions are they're going to have the opportunity to ship this stuff back and forth. And then you got the caravans that are all involved in that, which are fun too, right? To where you ship resources back and forth, you create meaningful like alliances and agreements and things like that. So this is extremely important, right? This to me is going to be one of the bigger, uh, uh, like one of the bigger like reasons for why a metropolis uh, develops quick and like thrives long-term, specifically economically, right? Cause you're gonna need that stuff. Mm -hmm. Right, and I think there might be also, you might need to establish a trade agreement to get certain goods to build certain buildings too, right? Mm -hmm. Then that resource yeah. might not be available in oh, your mm -hmm. particular node area. Exactly. It's like if we need like a ton of lumber, maybe let's say a specific type of lumber for a specific building, in our metropolis we need to get that thing built we need this to thrive as a city metropolis all the way to the top uh we don't have that here we need that specific resource better come up with a really good agreement with that other that one city that's got a bunch of it you have to get it somehow then the interesting thing is like would people be able to fully bypass a trade agreement and just have like players go and do their own sort of like trading. I mean, I'm sure it's possible, but I don't know, man, to, to get it in the like kind of quantity that hopefully they're going to expect you to get it in. Um, I hope that it's like very substantial. Yeah. And I'm wondering like with the caravan system, even if you have a trade agreement, right, that isn't a guarantee you'll be able to get the resources either. Exactly. Right. And even on, from a, from a player standpoint, even if you have a, maybe a guild that's got a particular node mm -hmm. and they go out and farm at it, might take a you know a village to get that back as well so i think there's maybe ways around it but i don't know that they're going to be faster than establishing a trade agreement i would imagine yeah so yeah okay so there's the answer in chat okay they were talking about node xp i want to go on with the next one here if a martial dps archetype takes a magical dps secondary archetype for example rogue and mage 
which is a night spell. How will the scaling of that class's DPS and abilities work? Will it scale off of physical stats, magic stats, or both? Steven decided not to answer this until they have a deeper dive into combat. Oh, it's one of the questions that I would kill for an answer on because I want to understand from a theory crafter perspective how this stuff's going to work. I think that the answer is going to be it depends on the, the, the primary archetype and it depends on what you're augmenting it with. So, you know, if it's a mage, I mean, I think it's going to be likely it depends on the... Yeah, I think it's going to depend more on the augmentation, but the question is, what's their augmentation system look like? And I think that's why the tech question comes in. The qu the yeah. tech point that he made on there. So, Rip the Dream, yeah. friends. We're still waiting to know more about that detail, and I'm uh, anxiously waiting with you. Okay, cool. All right. Will there be an in-game tool to help keep track of where your store where you store items absolutely there is a user experience they don't want to make cumbersome they want players to know uh, where things are at and then the meaningful thing is traveling to that location to get them particularly as it relates to material and raw gatherable one thing that will be included is when you're within a node or economic region you can be at a crafting station and have access to pull from your personal storage and warehouse storage at the node thank you Thank you. Does anybody else like, do you feel like that's cool? Cause some people might be like you, you're pulling from it. You don't have it on hand at that place you're at. That doesn't seem realistic. Some things are okay not to be realistic because quality of life yeah. matters. Yeah. Cause new world double dip with that. And it was so freaking annoying because <sighs> you would go and travel like, to go and get something from like a far off area. Now, granted, you had some limited ability to fast travel, but still, it's like you get all that, and then you realize your other stuff is back in and going back and forth and oh, back no. and forth. And That's there was a that. limited amount of bag space too, so it was just horrendous to do yeah. that. So I'm glad they're not double dipping. I mean, I'm I'm okay with a little less realism in this part. Yeah, exactly. Magisto said yeah. it best. Yeah. quality of life feature right there so important this is to me this is like respecting a player we talk about respecting a player's coin purse and also respecting a player's time because that's a resource that as we just don't get back right it's important to me that if i'm investing time that it feels like it was worth the time invested like in my life right like there's nothing worse for me than sitting there and just quite literally just, just rolling that wheel man just keeping it going for the sake of i've got to be on doing this thing and I, I go run for 30 minutes of doing this stuff and things and i'm still now just getting ready to get started like you got the resources you got the stuff and things like it shouldn't be this job like literally like a real life sort of job actually going on here um yeah anyway that's my perspective i think it's very different isn't it it's very different to like not try to expect somebody to live a job in game versus like making it an intriguing elaborate system that requires skill. I think it's a very different, very different thing. Um, and you could definitely do one without the other. Um, okay. This one, we are coming up at the end of the questions here, so we should be able to hit on the other point before we get too much further into it here. But during monster coin events, will the hate lists for NPCs, restrict the effect the buildings players can target and disable. All right, that's talking about when you are essentially using a monster coin, you're in control of a monster. That's what this question's about. When events occur, there are prescribed and specific objectives that can be targeted. You are not streamlined into one particular. There is an option to choose from, but those are not influenced by any hate list. That may be incurred from NPCs. When you are playing as a monster from a monster coin event, your focus is on completing objectives that have already been prescribed as a part of the event. For example, if the predicate system queued, which started an event, a number of spawners activate around the node. I'm not actually going to go through this, right? Like, I'm not going to go through and explain that. Because what the long and short of it is, you've got goals, buildings, etc. cetera, are the goals. Your job is to complete the goals. That's your duty as a monster. You want to be a successful monster? You got to take out the stuff and things. You got to do it. So they said, 
that an event can have a number of targets, such as getting into disabling the armory, the barracks. I hear disabling the armory. I don't just hear destroying it. Like, I'm actually hoping there's, like, even... I don't know, man. Like, not necessarily espionage elements, but, like, sneaky sort of roguelike tactics with certain monsters. Like, I feel like that would be really cool. But they're, they're talking about things like getting into the armory, the barracks, the workshop, when you become a monster. Um, those are basically, like, your three objectives in a certain type of event. You may not need to destroy all three. You may just need to destroy one, right? You may even have targets that are NPCs, such as the blacksmith. Wait, why am I getting Dark Overlord stuff and things right now? <laughs> you call me. Come on. I'm reading here. This is what happens when I stray off the path. I should just read it verbatim. But I think it's cool. This, You know what's funny about this, though? Remember back in the day when people go, <laughs> go into MMORPGs, they go into a, a, like an a enemy city, if they go in, they kill the quest giver or like an NPC or something. Someone can't yeah, access it. Those, those, that. This feels uh, like, hey, you're going to actually get to do that as a part of the system. Oh true. my God. I feel like you're going to be able to troll so hard as a monster sometimes. Granted, it's an event, so it may not always happen, but I guess. Exactly. You, yeah. It's not just like randomness to have that happen so i'm, I'm kind of curious you know like it would be very interesting if like specific like i don't know how it's going to be right like is the event going to mean you can only control a specific monster or do you get to choose a monster and then that monster has like specific like points like it would be fun if i was like hey i'm gonna use a monster coin cool i've got like the brood mother and i've got um the dweedle rogue and if i choose the dweedle rogue then i can go run around the city and i can like you know like take out like blacksmiths and a bunch of like different things maybe emote or something as i'm like running by and sneaking and stuff as like the the dweedle rogue the dweedle rogue is clearly a goblin okay so um yeah it's not a real life reference to anything we talked about here much okay will mobs be able to buff each other when grouped up this is basically the same kind of conversation we started with in the earlier question about getting knocked off your worst like i'm going to give you the long and short of it you can check the full answer on the hq obviously because we've got the bullet points up there from every dev live stream the answer short of it is yes right and that the AI system is extremely versatile. This is the thing they've been working on for a while. They've been talking about it for some time. This goes back to like sometime after Alpha 1, right? Yeah, they were talking about that upgrade. I think they had that whole goblin raid too yeah. as well where they were talking a little bit about it. Yep. So the question is, is when do we get to see what you're going for here with this versatile AI? Because it sounds like it's a pretty big upgrade mm, i'm curious about that because let's be real man in alpha one some of the npcs were like really annoying it was like oh my god i just got stun locked for so long by these fools you've got to pick up the bag over here there's freaking like eight of these fools you try to go over there you try to like kite these guys back and like kill them no they stun lock you you get three homies and, you, and they still stun lock and kill your group you're like friends did we need to do this for the alpha one i say with all the love in the world i want to stress the point love that didn't feel loved <laughs> yeah the, that goblin that goblin villager is definitely oh. ptsd inducing my friend and they respawn so fast oh yes oh that yes. was so painful people were like let's go in there and farm for xp and i'm like okay and then we went in there and it was like i don't want to do this i do not I, want to I play believe anymore. my response after that was like ow ow no ow <laughs> <laughs> i quit you i quit you it's not personal y'all it's just i don't yeah i want to feel good about my existence is all i'm saying um True. with levelings <laughs> With leveling set to take a while, will each level have a reward attached to it? I like this question. Mm -hmm. And I want to actually have a, a discussion here about this. So chat, hope you're with us still. They said yes. 
there will be something for each level, but some levels will be more monot or sorry, momentous than others, but there will not be a drought between leveling process where there's nothing for a level and it's not indicative of what good reward or progression system is. I agree. Like there's nothing worse, especially in a game where like leveling is actually like a, it's a, it's you're not, you're not doing it quick and easy. And Ashes is absolutely that kind of game. Like, you're not going to get to max level extremely fast. I think there's even more reason for these, like, momentous occasions. Like, some are going to be big, but at least everyone will feel like, oh, really cool. I, I got something useful for me now, not just, like, a stat bump, you know? Like, and I don't even want to say, like, I feel like if they can, if they can orient progression... To like doing something meaningful for my class kit predominantly, right? Like something to really, and I think as a theory crafter, I really appreciate this when games do this, but you put us back to looking at what our toolkit is, how our stats are working with things. I think it's an extremely organic way without holding hands to sort of encourage people to pay attention to what they need to be learning about especially for someone who doesn't play MMORPGs like regularly, you know, like, Oh, you got this new skill. And then it's like, boop. And it works. It's like, here's what you got. And then you look at that and you're like paying attention to, okay, so this works with this, this works with this. And now I'm educating myself along the way. I, to me, that's like the most organic way to, to teach players how to play their class. Anyway. I mean, I like the idea of, and I was just kind of thinking about this because City of Heroes did something, um, again, it was fairly simple, right? You either got a new power or you got enhancement slots to put in. So it'd be interesting to see what they mean by the rewards. Is it like maybe a chest with some coin and a, you know, and a, and a good, I would say relatively good piece of gear. That could be one option. It could be like more augmentation slots. Um, it could be, I mean, obviously stats should be part of it too, or some sort of scaling, um, but not the only thing, um, like you were saying. And then, um, and obviously new skills. And I'm the only thing that I would say with new skills is sometimes, you know, some developers consider, oh, you just got a new rank of something you already have is like, okay, that's your reward. I'm not necessarily mm, a fan of that. Yeah, I believe there should right. be like different layers yeah. each level especially if like you said um you know and we experienced right in in alpha um alpha one right it took a decent amount of time to invest to get there uh yeah so yeah it would be good that it'd be something meaningful yeah that and that was i mean that was clearly like a work in progress at the time but i mean i've certainly played games where you just feel like i love i leveled up and it's like i it was like almost there was like nothing really there all you got was like the ding and it's like, oh, cool. All right. On to the next one. So I'd have to say the yeah. chat is talking about EQ. I mean, it was still like a dopamine hit, you know, right, right to the carotid when you got that ding, man, as hard as it was to level in that <laughs> game. <laughs> New sandal in every chest. Oh, my God, dude. You all are ridiculous. Chad, I'm serious. You really are. All of you. Lies and slander, too. You should remember it's not nice to do that. Okay. We're going to talk about this final point. I saw an article on the forums in the past week talking about intrepid should be careful on taking everyone's feedback, and here's why. It's basically gamers don't usually know what they are talking about or what they want. So that's the only point I'm going to pull from. And this isn't even to call this person out because... I think it's a good conversation topic because there are definitely people who don't even know what they want. They just want to feel good about it. Mm -hmm. Right. Chasing that hit. Now I, I would, I would inherently from like, just from like that, what I read, I would disagree with that. I actually, I actually think that a lot of players, especially when an MMORPG is concerned, the majority, that doesn't mean everyone, but I think the majority of MMORPG players, I think they do know what they want. And I think that's a big part of like what attracts them to a specific game, right? Now, there's like the the, the weighing and the balancing act of 
uh, what things about a game potentially maybe you don't want or like, and the things that you really want and like. And is the latter actually going to weigh heavily enough, you know, to, to incentivize you to be a big part of it? Um, I think I don't I think that in some ways, like when I hear questions like that, and I it's not like it's just on the forums. I've heard this like other places, too. I've heard it in comments. I've seen it in like live streams. I've seen it um, in discussions and comments on our videos. Um, I've seen it in my own chat sometimes talking around ashes. Um, and I don't know, man, I, I think that there is like a level of. Well, I don't even say level. I just think it's unfair to say that because I think a lot more people are competent these days and are very much aware of what they want. Right. I don't think that they're that the, that the player base, especially these days is like that deficient in capability to, to have an awareness of what it is that they're looking for, what, what their, you know, feedback might be around something. So to not take the feedback of, of people and Trump, doesn't have to change a vision, but I still think it's important to like, see where the players are landing on a variety of different topics and they do this. And I think it's wise that they do this, but yeah, it's something I, I kind of think is an interesting thing to, to gauge people's I, ideas on whether you're watching on YouTube later, whether you're here in chat whether we're here right now, you and I, um, that's kind of my perspective. Yeah, I think, I mean, I know where this person is going because there's definitely been developers that um, have changed the course of their game based on feedback that wasn't necessarily like the right decision. And I think something that Maggie said might have been a stream or two ago um, about vision really resonated with me and made I thought of this when we were talking about this post. And it's just that it's like if you have you're going to mm. get a bunch of feedback, right? The feedback isn't necessarily all good feedback, right? There's going to be ideas that are going to fly in the face of what you as a developer have as your vision. And, and it's important, in my opinion, right, if you go out and you sell a vision that you stick with that vision, right? It isn't, you know, mm. so mutable that if the wind is blowing another way, like it has in other games, like you totally change your game because that's what the majority of people don't want. And you would rather chase the coin purse than, you know, execute your vision. And that's one thing that I do really like. Um about what and in, how intrepid has presented their vision and has stuck to it that's not to say that it you know they haven't made tweaks but it hasn't ever been like a tweak to the guiding principles of the game right which we've seen and happen in other games like completely change what how the game you know will unfold because the air quotes like majority of people want something different um and so that's like, I guess that's my take on it. I do tend to agree right there. There's a, a gambit of people out there that know their stuff or have a strong opinion and, and can make a good argument to back it up. There's also other people that want to make a game something different than it is. Right. I don't know how many like early on and maybe it's still going on. I haven't really mm. thought about it, but we had people saying, hey, I want to I want to pve only server for ashes i mean All i'm right. not a pvp uh, i'm not a pvp player and even i was like no <laughs> right. that's not gonna happen <laughs> right because when it's pvx you you have you have a delicate balance you've built into the core of that game yeah. you can't just turn off one part of it and expect it to work like it's supposed to work mm -hmm. period it's a different game at that point and so i tend to agree yes you have to be careful when you listen to feedback you have to align it with what your guiding principles are as a vision. And you do have to also have some knowledge to say, look, hey, if something isn't working, you have to not necessarily be. It's exactly something they said on the stream, actually, was like my, you know, my asset is is not. They were talking about like somebody not getting attached to an asset in the way it is. We we'll kind of see that the same way about like potentially like how game systems are executing, not like whether or not to have a game system or not and air quotes, you know, changing the vision. Um, but like whether or not something is really panning out the way you expect and want it to, 
that's when I would say, okay, yeah, you can make a change and you, you shouldn't hold fast to something that is just an idea that isn't working. And that's yeah. different than like how we've seen some developers that's go in and change the vision so they can maximize the coin purse. That's it, dude. I say it, you're trying to min max the coin purse. It's a hundred percent the the real deal from my perspective. And um man, I don't I, I just think it's really important what Intrepid's been doing. And I know I, I had a question or a comment, I think it was on the uh got a theory ashes talk from last week and it was like something about thinking that the en- emphasis and this is like a bit of a different uh bullet point here but we were they were talking about how uh intrepid on their development pipeline right now and the progress they're making and the, and the progress that's kind of been catapulting them forward um they've been intrepid's been really big when they implement changes to things to getting the feedback i mean you go to their forums right now And you're just going to see like so many different things are up there about the do race concepts and like character creator. And you've got like the, the, the different tech they've been showing off the seasons. I mean, it's like every time they showcase some of this stuff, they're like, let us know what you think. Let us know your feedback and let's, let's talk about it. Right. They've, they've acted on some of the uh, feedback from players around like some of the races and how they look, for example. Um, so and they won't change everything, but they're definitely receptive to it. And I think that being receptive to it's important. But I wanted to read this point someone made talking about Intrepid and their progress right now. And it was, I think the emphasis on a tools first approach suggests that Impre- Intrepid could sling shot past expectations. And I thought that was a very important thing to note, too, because I do wonder, and I'm not saying that my goalposts have changed at this point in regard to when I believe we're likely going to see an Alpha 2. I still believe it's not going to be till roughly second quarter to the summer in 2023 next year. That's my that's my belief, right? When we get to Alpha 2, I think that's going to be a very progressive period for the game i think that we're going to see a lot of things happening at exponential rates for good reason i think because of the fact that they're um working out of unreal engine 5 for example it's going to have them able to be more capable to make adjustments to the game more proactively um and probably in a lot of ways more uh frequently with a lot like a lot more ease um which is going to allow them to sort of go in and bug fix things related to whatever we're testing relatively quick along the way. So I think that, that, um, that like sort of feedback from the players and then being proactive at like adjusting and making fixes is going to help to really propel it forward fast. Um, But I think the unreal engine five element alone, then being in there when we get to that point. Oh yeah. And they've been picking up more staff. That's a good point. They've continued to pick up more and more staff lately. Um, but I think when we get to un- or get to um, Alpha Two and Unreal Engine Five, I think you're going to notice that there's going to be a lot of like bounding progress because when they get to that point, they're going to have to have the majority of things ready to roll. Like they open for Alpha Two, like there's no, hey, we've got a bunch of systems down sort of thing. It's like things are ready to rock and roll, and we're just building upon the foundation at this point. So that's a big part of the reason that my expectations for um alpha 2 at this point they aren't like oh we're gonna get it this year i'm like nah man they got they got some serious fundamental things to get rolling but when they get that stuff done and we do go to alpha 2 i think that that's going to be a really nice thriving period of time for the ashes of creation community we're certainly going to be lit around here of that i'm sure um Mm -hmm. That's our show, man. That's it right there. We hit our markers. We talked about our stuff and things. Next week, I think we're going to be actually having a little more free form, community oriented stuff. Stay tuned for the Pathfinder post show. But before we dip, I didn't get the commands ready. I'm sorry to my mods. But Dayless, why don't you shout out your domains and where people can find you when you're not on the Pathfinder podcast? Sure. You can find me on Twitter at The Ashen Herald and on YouTube, youtube.com slash C slash The Ashen Herald. 
Now, friends, I know I don't always promote it and everything, but do join us on discord.gg forward slash some org. That's where uh, the Ashes HQ community, the Pathfinder podcast community, the Ashes fam here around this uh, community, or just generally the community that I foster um, around all the stuff and things. We gather around, chat daily, have good times, share lots of stuff and things. Good vibes, good times is what we're about. So definitely make sure you're in there to not miss anything going on here in the community. And uh, remember that even though we're at the end of today's show, right, that you don't have to be on this show to be a Pathfinder. It's literally everybody in chat, everybody that comments on YouTube, everybody that listens to the podcast when they're driving to work, etc. You all are Pathfinders. You're part of the journey with us. So much love to all of you, to Intrepid Studios. And until next week, Live your best lives, walk in the light, and have a great night, everybody. We'll catch up with you again real soon. Bye, everybody. Take care, everybody.